Hello, everyone. It is one o'clock in the Eastern US time zone. And as such, we will get started. My name is Jason Govari. I'm from Cornell University. And today I have the privilege of facilitating the discovery track of the 2020 LD4 conference, along with Mich Michelle Fraternik, LD4P program manager based at Stanford. Today is the last day of the discovery track. Um, and with that, we will have three presentations, each of which will be individual presentations rather than a panel. And as such, there will be question and answer opportunities following each speaker. I will encourage all participants to please enter your questions into the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, and within that feature, unlike the other days, uh, we have set the settings to allow for upvoting and commenting by other participants. So please engage with each other's questions. If you see something you like, upvote it so that it is more likely to appear as one of the first questions that we ask. Uh, as I mentioned, today we will have three talks and I will start those off in just a quick second. But before we do, I would like to encourage everybody to look at the, um, the links in the, sli in the slide being shared right now, particularly the last link, uh, the Community Participation Guidelines. By attending this session, you agree to abide by those guidelines, which are designed to ensure a safe space for all those attending. If you have witnessed activities that go counter to these guidelines, please report according to the process outlined. With that, I would like to turn it over to our first set of speakers, Charlene Chu and Alexander Provo from, the, from New York University. Welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon, good morning. Um, as you can see the title of our presentation today, Will Link Data Enhance the Discovery of Multilingual Resources? This is an open question. Alice and Charlene would like to create a space for us to discuss and figure out answers together. When we look back, the library community have made many efforts to enhance the discovery of multilingual resources in recent years. For example, Unicode implementation, covering different kinds of romanization systems, adding original script into the bibliographic record. A great example is automatically adding Cyrillic text in OCLC will benefit WCAG users who want to search using Cyrillic characters. Next. So as you can see, when we Google and search internet, we can see so many multilingual websites or organization, for example, UNESCO. And actually the interface have a six language tab for you to choose. Think about ISLA, and there are seven language tab. For different kind of user, they can have their language option. For now, maybe you can Google and search how many language is Google available in? The answer is, is 164 language already available. And uh, if you go to the Google translation website, there are 109 language available and using AI or machine learning product. And they are most language code actually they conform to ISO 639.1 identifiers. So just look at our library community and you can see as of January 2020, there are 483 languages available. I mean, different, I mean, for different kinds of resource in the WorldCat. Next. So for the agenda of today's presentation, our objective is really want to think how to enhance the discovery of multilingual resources because there are many issues related to this very complex subject. We're talking about different data model in LRM. I mean, still a lot of debates on works versus expressions. Think about difference between translations and language expressions, original script and romanized forms. We also want to review some discovery platform as use cases. We also want to review linked data models and platform. For example, different Synopia, OCLC work idea, EMI project. And also you, we want to share on why you use cases and our Wikidata project. Next. 
So first, we'll look at an if law LRM. It's very interesting to see the opening statement and for this very long manual. And I say, so it somehow is very clear for librarians, all translation are viewed as expression of the same work. However, right society have a very different concept of work and regard each translation as distinct work. So that's why there's a kind of a lot of discussion and debate. How can we distinguish between work and expression? There's also a lot of discussion in, if you listen to the student discussion in the library school, this is also a very popular topic. I only want to provide some scenarios for us to think about. And uh, for example, if it's a bilingual book written by a bilingual speaker, how can we say which one is the primary language treated as original work, the other one is secondary language treated as translation? Or if this book simply with two equivalent languages? If I have a book in hand, so I would say manifestation, it's translation, but I really couldn't find what's the original title, what's the original language. According to RDA 6.2.2.6, and there's instruction for that, also, there's a lot of religion publications and they are actually intermediate translations. How can we deal with, with really accurate data model? So also a translation can be in a related expression. So we're talking about is a text versus audiobook. Also in the serial ISN community, as also they have different ISN number assigned. I just want to give very simple example of Reader's Digest. The Reader Digest in English definitely have different contents in Japanese in Asia because they may invite a local writer to provide local contents. So they are actually not really the same contents. Next. So also in RDA Toolkit, you can see very specific instruction when you want to describe expression for date, language, and different kind of distinguishing characteristics and also identifier. So you can find that kind of example to really want to differentiate the same work with different kind of expression. So let me summarize or just recap. So that's why we have a question, one model fits all? Maybe not. So we do agree a general model for mapping. However, if we have use cases you know, locally, we may need a local modification or customization, for example, vocabulary, property, extension, et cetera. Next. So over here, you know, I still remember when I involved different testing and this diagram came to my mind is actually Baba Tilly created this diagram and try to answer the question on when, how do we know, you know, what is the cutoff point? Is it the same work? The same expression is new expression or when is a new work. So you can see the this new work, it means it could be a new genre. For example, if it's novel being adapted to a screenplay. So it's really changing of the generic, it's really changing the, the genre. And um, so over here, it really instruct me. I know how to deal with this in a market environment, but how about the different data model, I'm not quite sure. Next slide. So over here, you can see when we look at different kind of library catalog globally, and uh, how do you define translation in a bilingual or multilingual country? So the example on the top is really from Canada. And as you know, Canada is a bilingual country, and it's always it's fascinating to see this the cataloging record in English and also equivalent in French. And you see the example on the bottom is from National Library of Switzerland and there are four language tabs. And uh, if I choose language for Italian, so I will see the interface change into Italian. However, if, if it's German good book is really catalog in German, you will still see that German record in that interface. Next. So over here, you also can see an example in Primo. It means a very popular interface. 
So we want to see the discovery system to display original script versus transliteration. So you can see on the top is read a summary screen. So you can see a lot of information just parallel and they are all like a, a group of information right there. If you go to the detail screen, then you can see title being divided into two title la label. One is for non-Latin script, another one called title is Romanized form. But for author, you still see parallel information right there, also same for attribution. Next. So also can see example also in print mode on the top is the Persian. As you can see this Persian title, including original script, translation, and also transliteration. But it's not that easy to have all that information displayed in a very consistent manner. So you can see the information there is on the top, is different from the one at the lower one. And also, I think it's fascinating to see the example from National Library Australia. Some of you may see their records in OCLC. They have 244, two, I'm sorry, 242 Sophia Y is translated title in English. As you can see, Australia is an English speaking country and they have this Chinese book in their collection. And they have this translated title available there for the English speaking user. Next. Okay, so now let's switch to the different environment. So as you know, BigFriend testing is going on for several years. According to LC BigFriend report, over here, I just want to summarize a few points. As for authorized access point, we have to use Romanized form because it has to be consistent with LC NAV. It means it's really the NAV authority file, and that means the one access field, and that can link to the LC NAV. However, LCNF has not implemented Unicode yet. So definitely challenging for the discovery of non-Roman script, especially for historical and real materials. It means some of the characters still in Romanized form without the original script. For the script data, like the title proper, statement of responsibility, you only input the original script. But over here, I want to just use the real example as a mark. But look at 245 field. It has a lot of information there using the equal sign to separate it. It means the title in original script, Romanized form from the source. It means from the original country. Translated title. And also ALALC Romanized form in United States. We know how to do in mark, but how about different? And also it could be another scenario for partially parallel title. Next. So I also check with the different vocabulary. I want to know what kind of title property or different kind of title available. So over here, if you look at a title entity definition, title information relating to a resource, work title, preferred title, instant title, transcribed title, translated title, variant form of title, and the variant title is a subclass under title. And the under variant title subclass including key title, abbreviated title, parallel title, collective title. So if you go to the parallel title, it means title in another language and the or script. However, when we do the different project, and then we know a lot of data being converted as really repetitively. If you go to the publication information, 260 or 264 field. So usually Romanized form comes first, original script comes after with a comma to separate them. But if you have the data of publication 2018, somehow it has a language tag. It's for Chinese, but actually this is not really in Chinese. If you look at the notes field in 500 field, if there's no romanized form in notes, and then you will see a note in Chinese information with the language tab just assigned to it. Next. So over here, 
you can see if we talking about convert mark into BigFriend, there's a lot of legacy data missing original script. It may have incorrect coding, etc. Especially for translation, we think a language tag is pretty hard to be accurate. So over here, I just want to provide example to compare. As you can see, the original title in Japanese and being translated into Chinese. But this record, you can see the Japanese, the title in Japanese font actually using the Chinese language tag there. But on the, on the other hand, the example on the bottom, it is just simply one language in Japanese, and that's why it has an accurate code language tag for JA, JPAM, and that is really the ISO coding. Next. So over here, in the past two or three years, is really see a lot of discussion and debates on different kind of language tags. We're talking about in Mark, different ISO, BCP 47, et cetera. But there's still a lot of questions people try to evaluate and thinking, how do we use this sub tag for script and region effectively, for example, for BCP 47? But is that really compatible with Mark legacy data? How can we map all this kind of standard and really make sense? On the other hand, I also see very interesting comment from W3C community is the golden rule when creating language tag is to keep the tag as short as possible. Avoid reading, script, or other sub tag except when they add useful distinguishing information. So we still see potential solution as you can see, LC uh, Mac discussion paper, they try to reinstate the 241 field for translatory title. We are very excited to see PCC Bible report last week, and they recommend using different kind of language tag for different kind of scenarios. Next. So also, if we look at the Synopia, um, as you can see, the LD4 non Latin affinity group, they also have a report. So I don't want to repeat, repeat any information. I just want to summarize a few points is they are more flexible in different editor. However, there's more option and interpretation. There's still issue with the diacritics, lookup service. And also because they only display limited information, it's really hard to see relationship. It's hard to really see the, the relationship structure. Next. So over here, just an example. So you can see if I search and I can see different kind of see the search result for work and instance. But you can see different kind, different kind of information there. For example, for work, only original script. For instance, could be both for both original script and the Romanized form. But some of them Romanized form come first, some as original script come first. Next. So when I did the Synopia testing, I really, really somehow miss using RIMF when I attend the idea workshop. I love this platform. Is when I create WEMI, I can just click the tab, the button for tree structure. So I can see WEMI, this kind of entity relationship so easily. And that's the kind of information we're looking for to really for data visualization. Next. So over here, I want to summarize. We can see different kind of data model. They try to map WEMI, and you can see different with HAR, ShareVD using Opus. But you can see when Opus HAR need, needed is really work, expression of Opus. But there's a lot of terminology there. It's pretty challenging. So for OCLC Work ID project, I look for this definition in Wikidata. Is really an identifier for work level item. For example, I'm looking for pride and prejudice in Spanish and English, and they have a separate work ID. And I can just find this English edition in Wikidata, click that work ID and link to the OCLC work ID. And also you can see um, for Spanish edition, you can see 336 edition with so many holdings. Okay, Alex. Your turn. Thank you, Charlene. Um, so I'll briefly now touch on um, some of the questions that Charlene has raised 
um, and topics and share some digital NYU digital collections as examples compared alongside Wikidata. Um, so as Charlene mentioned, the PCC Babel task group recently published their report um, and I found their types of language information in description to be a helpful framework. Um, and so today I'll be talking about bullet point three here, um, the language of particular strings. The first example I'd like to share with you is Arabic Collections Online. This is a cross-institutional partnership to digitize and create e-resource marks for public domain Arabic language publications. The website is created by our Digital Library Technology Services Department and is designed as a dual interface with English and transliteration of Arabic into Latin script on the left and Arabic and Arabic script on the right. Um, so the MARC metadata is used to power on um, the site and the search results. So all of this metadata is searchable in the site. So for example, if you enter the transliterated title or the Arabic script title of Avicenna's Kitab al-Shifa, you would land on this book as long as we have um, both in there. And here you can see the book viewer application with metadata in English uh, and transliteration on the left. And, uh, and here you can see the same book uh, with metadata displayed in Arabic. And it's our project policy to uh, following national US standards used in MARC cataloging to only provide the script metadata if the field in question is in Arabic language. Um, so because this metadata is derived from MARC records, this means we are not able to include translations in this interface. And as a result, we sometimes run into unevenness and don't have as much Arabic script metadata as we might like. And to me, this points to a mismatch between the data we have available to build the website and what we might actually ideally like the website to do. And that's caused by both our cataloging practices and our technical approach via MARC. So I wanted to offer um, and think through linked data as another way of conceptualizing and storing information about the language of strings. And so um, Wikidata, which many of you are probably quite familiar with, would be a great example um, to, to illustrate this. Um, so here you can see the book that I was just showing on the ACO website with my interface language set to English. And in Wikidata, the label statements are what power this multilingual content. And you can see many are available in different languages. If I switch my interface to Italian, um, when a label is available in this language, you'll see the properties and values change um, to, this, to Italian. So as a data creator, I wouldn't have to rekey these values to create a record in Italian as I would with Mark. Instead, they're pulled in using the labels we saw on the last screen for each of these linked entities and properties. Um, so, uh, of course, someone has to enter the labels in each language, which is an issue of labor I'll address later. Um, if the label is not available, um, oh, sorry, I just wanted to say, here you can see uh, written work becomes opera scritta. Um, next one. And the labels can be accessed via protocols like Sparkle. So here's the result of a query that retrieves the labels of the Book of Healing plus their language tags. And just a quick shout out to our colleague, Lauren, who imparts sparkle wisdom upon us uh, as part of our NYU Libraries Wikimedians Learning Group, which has biweekly sparkle meetups. And on the topics of transliteration and representation of language in different scripts, um, we were poking around the results and noticed that some languages have uh, these different orthographies or representations stored using these kind of two-part language codes. Um, and so you can see uh, the top is an example of a particular orthography of Belarusian. And in the bottom, you have several examples um, of different varieties of Chinese, such as here, simplified Chinese script. And some of these language codes are particular to Wikidata, but there's an effort to align them with DCP 47, which Charlene mentioned. In Wikidata, language can also be associated with other strings besides labels, such as the title. And you can see uh, here we've got an Arabic title stored with a mandatory language tag, which is visible in the snippet of turtle I've included. So this um, thinking about language of description and how Wikidata stores multilingual labels 
makes me ponder how a digital library pro project like ACO could be different if we made use of linked data instead of or in addition to MARC. Could we have more Arabic script metadata? Would we maybe include translations in addition to transliteration? And might this serve user needs and website design that we can't right now? Um, I just also wanted to uh, say that the previous slides show how the technical model of using language tags with RDF literals um, could help us think through library cataloging practice in a new way. And there are lots of interesting debates um, happening on Wikidata related to the practice side as well. Um, and touch on sort of what Charlene shared earlier about the lines between additions and works. Um, I'm running out of time, but a second multilingual project I wanted to share is our Hemispheric Institute Digital Video Library. Um, we collaboratively create original description with the Hemispheric Institute um, for these videos of, about performance and politics in the Americas. The Institute generates the description, which is used uh, as the basis for pages on their own website and also for us to create mark that goes to our library catalog and is used to publish a digital library website. The Hemispheric Institute is a trilingual organization, sort of like some of the examples um, Charlene showed earlier in the presentation. And their website is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And so not all metadata is translated, which I think speaks to the labor that's involved in, in providing translations. Um, but I really love that their site um, shows a desire for multilingual presentation, discovery, and indexing. And on the digital library website produced by our team in Digital Library Technology Services, um, we don't find the same level of multilingual content, and that's because the website is built on our MARC metadata. Um, this website will actually be retired soon, but um, we still have the same problem in our library catalog where we just don't have as much multilingual access. Um, so to sum up my NYU examples, uh, link, I think linked data models which accommodate multilingual labels uh, and provide more granular information about transliteration offer a solution to what is a design feature of MARC, but what can become a limitation when we try to use this data in other contexts like multilingual digital collections. Um, so it's, again, as I said, labor intensive to produce translations. We think about um, you know, what that shift in focus might entail. Uh, perhaps machine learning and AI can help us along with human curation. And we've had some interest um, in using the ACO metadata to kind of work on those natural language processing uh, problems. And yeah, however we make our multilingual metadata, we think it um, uh, shows new opportunities and our, that our projects, which have been making it work with Mark, show these new opportunities and desires for multilingual discovery. And just a few concluding remarks from Charlene. We would like to just have a few concluding remarks. Um, I was really inspired by Cliff Lynch's common multilingual metadata is cross-cultural retrieval for more than mere cross-language searching. So this is really makes us humble and we think about, every time we think about multilingual metadata, actually probably we need a perspective to think about is more than that. It's really multicultural, multilingual context and try to think holistically. As Alex just mentioned, we work with scholarly communities. Some of they are DH scholar or they involve open scholarship. And they actually want to use like AI or natural language processing tools. We try to be open-minded. And when we speak to some scholars and their demand could be really very basic. I just want a language options. I want the original script. I really want the text just in Unicode. So we think this is, a, this journey is ongoing. We would like to engage more domain experts, work with different language community and the technologists. Thank you all. And this is our email address. If you have any question, I'm sorry we are running out of time. Please feel free to email us. Thank you so much. Um, even though we are pretty much at time, I would like to um, to ask one question that did come into Q&A um, so that you have an opportunity to respond um, hopefully quickly if you don't mind. Where do you think we can make the most progress in providing better multilingual metadata slash metadata about multilingual resources? Our models, tools, or adding URIs to what we already do? 
Um, maybe I can speak first. It just I think I think we're making a lot of progress. On the other hand, I think in addition to model, my data model, I think we should think about some sort of different scenario. Where we have our local approach as well. I think we need to make it flexible. On the other hand, working with technologists, I think is really important. Alex. Oh yes, thank. No, I have nothing more to add there. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I, if you don't mind, I will post um, remaining questions into the um, the Slack space, the Slack uh, channel for this um, for this track, which is the discovery track. So, um, if you don't mind engaging in that space, that would be very much appreciated. Um, up next, we will turn it over to Cliff Landis and Allison F. Smith from Atlanta University Center's Robert W. Woodruff Library. Great, thank you so much. Uh, is everyone able to see my screen all right? Yes. Okay, awesome. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cliff Landis. I guess I should say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Cliff Landis. And I'm Allison Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. And together we're going to be presenting on a project we've been working on for the past year, uh, GANCH, using linked open data for Georgia's natural, cultural, and historic organization's disaster response. Unlike many of the presentations at the LD4 conference this year, we aren't going to be focused on discovery of materials held at GLAM institutions, but instead on discovery of the institutions themselves. So to briefly introduce the project design, the goal of this one-year project was to create a publicly editable directory of Georgia's natural, cultural, and historic organizations in Wikidata, allowing for quick retrieval of location and contact information for disaster response via a website. But first, let me give you a little background information for context. I'm the, digi I'm the digital initiatives librarian at the Atlanta University Center Robert W. Woodruff Library. We are the lead organization for this project. The library supports the teaching, learning, and research missions of its four institutions of higher education that comprise the world's largest consortium of HBCUs, Clark Atlanta University, the Interdenominational Theological Center, Morehouse College, and Spelman College. We want to give a huge thank you to Lyricist for funding this project through a Lyricist Catalyst grant. The Lyricist grant funded my position as graduate student and our web developer, Matthew Stevens. Additionally, team members Jessica Lemming and Alex Dade from the Digital Services Department of the AUC Woodruff Library both pitched in to help build this tool. Our partnering organizations. We're partnering with professional and government organizations across the state of Georgia and the southeastern United States. Some of our partners include provide assistance to NCH organizations impacted by disasters, including HERA, the, Hermiti the Heritage Emergency Response Alliance, SHER, the Savannah Heritage Emergency Response, and GEMA, the Georgia Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency. So I'll start off with a little bit of background and design. So why did we need this tool? Well, natural disasters are impacting Georgia at an alarming rate. In the last two years, Georgia experienced multiple months of flooding rainfall, a major tornado outbreak, and hurricanes Michael and Dorian. As the largest U.S. state east of the Mississippi River with 159 counties, Georgia has extensive and diverse natural, cultural, and historic sites that preserve and document the unique history and culture of the state. It would aid statewide efforts if our partner organizations could access a list of NCH organizations before and after a disaster strikes. For a real-time example, see this Hurricane Dorian event map used by FEMA to track NCH organizations in the path of the hurricane. We shared what data we had with FEMA from our coastal counties, counties so you can see that this data is being used in a real-time emergency response. The idea for this project started when I attended the Georgia Archives Institute, an annual two-week crash course in archival practice. I wanted to see a map of all the archives in Georgia, but none was available. So I started looking online for directories of cultural heritage organizations in Georgia, and I came across the GRAC Historical and Cultural Organizations Directory. 
GRAC is the Georgia Historical Records Advisory Council. I did a test web scrape of the data, cleaned it up, enhanced it with geocoordinates, and uploaded it to Wikidata. When I mentioned it to my department, Christi my department head, Christine Wiseman, she explained that she worked on the same directory while she worked at the Georgia Archives, and that the data set needed to be brought up to date. She suggested that we apply for a grant, and here we are. So in the past, how would these cultural heritage emergency responders find NCH organizations impacted by disasters? Well, the directory information is out there, but it's scattered in different data sets, none of which are publicly editable or up to date. As I said, we started with GRAC's Historical and Cultural Organizations Directory. And then we wanted to add the Georgia Historical Society's Directory of Affiliate Organizations and the Georgia Association of Museums and Galleries Directory, and the Georgia Public Library Service Directory, and several other directories, which we estimated at the time at over 1,500 organizational records combined. We knew that there would be some overlap between these directories, but we couldn't know how much until we got into it. While designing the project and writing the grant proposal, we tried to focus on several principles. Wikidata provides a flexible structure to represent many relationships in repeatable fields, so records are easily enhanced with additional data. Simple edits in Wikidata can be done manually by anyone, allowing for decentralized updates, so that there's no need for an institution or individual owner to grant access to the data for regular updates, thus removing bottlenecks. Facts represented in Wikidata are provided with an open license, so to honor this, we don't, use, we don't reuse any copyrightable content from our source data sets, like collection descriptions. Reference links are included for each statement, providing sourced information for verification and to provide direction for future updates. The project is being completed using free software, guaranteeing broad access and free implementation. We made an effort to provide a model for other states by documenting and presenting on all the processes we used. And we also designed the project to provide a graduate student paid internship to give an up and coming information professional practical experience working with linked open data. And we were very, very lucky to have Allison join the team. Thank you. So now we're going on to my favorite part, which is the workflow. So our workflow for collecting, verifying, and uploading the data. The software we utilize includes OpenRefine, GitHub, and Visual Studio Code. So in 2018, GLAM in Georgia, Wikidata, this is GLAM in Georgia with coordinate information. Wikidata is a free and open knowledge base that acts as a central store, storage for the structured data of its Wikimedia sister projects. We were first planning this project, we searched for all GLAM organizations in Georgia that have coordinate location information, which only pulled up about a few results, about 40. But if you search by GLAMs in the United States, you get more results in Georgia. This has to do with how the information is tagged, and this is the type of data we are cleaning and updating. One, another one of my favorite parts is finding hidden institutions. So we're also doing this project to find smaller hidden institutions, such as the Georgia Rural Telephone Museum, located in Leslie, Georgia. Even though there is an entry in Wikipedia, we didn't have this institution in any of our partners' data sets. The best part is including lesser institutions and adding them to the data set for disaster relief. So with NCH orgs in Georgia, we've made quite a bit of progress over the last 10 months. We widen our searches beyond, beyond GLAN to get as many relevant NCH organizations as possible. And as of July 7th, 2020, our big search for the entire state returns over 1,900 institutions. This search includes things like historic districts that don't have contact information so that emergency responders can cast as wide as net as possible when responding to a disaster. So NCH orgs in DeKalb County, being able to export contact information in table format will help emergency responders reach out to NCH organizations to see if they need assistance before and after a disaster strikes. So the first step, first we gather and verify data in Visual Studio Code. We start by scraping websites, gathering lists from partners and creating giant spreadsheets of NCH organizations. 
We then use free website tools to enrich the data with things like coordinate location and county. Two, we load the spreadsheets into OpenRefine and begin matching up organizations to their records in Wikidata. Then we reconcile our fields against Wikidata's and schema inside of OpenRefine. We have our data dictionary available on our GitHub site if you're curious about how we map the spreadsheets to Wikidata schema. Next, we create references for each link, each link data triple. So for every single fact we uploaded to Wikidata, we supply three values, the fact, the reference URL, and the retrieval date. By citing our sources with snapshots and timestamps, we'll give folks in the future the ability to trace and update each fact as things change over time. This allows us to track which organizations have dissolved, which allows us to exclude dissolved organizations from our search results. But we captured references using the Internet Archives data way back, Internet Archives Wayback Machine to take snapshots of web pages where we found each fact in order to show our work. Two unique things happened when using Internet Archives Wayback Machine. One, some of the domains we captured actually went away after we captured them. And two, because of when the time we were working on this project, there are a lot of websites that have captured how um, organizations have responded to COVID-19 information as that was on many home pages. And in five, we then uploaded information to Wikidata. The slide shows the Aragon Historical Society, which we've added as part of the testing phase. After the data is uploaded to Wikidata, we perform quality control on each entry to verify that things are correct especially the location coordinate data. Sometimes getting that coordination and location data is tricky, but we try to place the marker on the building itself, since after a disaster, street signs and other wayfinding markers are often damaged or destroyed. Great, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our website that we're developing and our outreach and sustainability efforts. So we're currently in the process of finalizing and testing our website to ensure that it meets emergency responders needs. Here you can see the initial homepage wireframe and mock flow. Now Wikidata can occasionally run slowly or be temporarily unavailable as some of you may know. So to prevent outages during a disaster, our web developer Matthew Stevens is designing the site to store the query results locally. The queries are then rerun on a regular schedule to keep the information up to date. We have three main query types, Georgia as a whole, individual Georgia counties, and then the eight GEMA regions that the Georgia Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency uses to divide up the state. The results page displays both a map and a table of directory information for these NCH organizations. We recognize that the website may be used on mobile devices after a disaster as cultural heritage first responders will be out in the field. So we're making sure to give the website a responsive design with my particular favorite feature, a table that converts to single cell format on mobile devices to prevent users from having to scroll left and right. We're also giving users instructions on how to export the tabular data directly from Wikidata to a CSV file so that it can be imported to other systems like Web EOC, otherwise known as the Web Emergency Operations Command, a software that a lot of emergency responders use. We're getting a lot of help from our partner organizations to, to get the word out about the project not only to their member institutions, but also more broadly to similar organizations in other states. By the end of this project in August of 2020, we're gonna hand off the project to state level partner organizations for long-term maintenance and sustainability. HERA, SHARE, and GEMA will integrate the final product into their disaster response workflows. Galileo, our statewide virtual library, is graciously providing web hosting. And Galileo and Georgia Home Place, our statewide digitization initiative, will perform the annual updates. We've built an emailer into the website so that folks at Galileo and Georgia Home Place can send out reminder emails once a year to these NCH organizations, requesting any updates to their contact information. 
If information has changed, the edits can be made directly in Wikidata, but if the email bounces back, we can look at the organization to see if it's been dissolved. To make sure that everything associated with the project is free, transparent, adaptable, and reproducible, we've created a GitHub repository which includes everything associated with the project. An example of this is our workflow manual shown here, which walks you through the entire process we've developed step by step. The only code that we're not releasing publicly is the final website, and that's for the security of Galileo's servers. So as we wrap up, we wanna look at some considerations, additional uses, and impact of the project. So some things to consider. Um, with our organizations, you might come across duplicate names and name, duplicates and name variations. Some organizations change their names or have aliases that create duplicates. Pay attention to the names and sometimes do a deeper dive into the history of an organization. Dissolved organizations. Due to some of the data sets being outdated, many more organizations are no longer in existence. The process to verify dissolved dates include reaching out to the organization's contact. Sometimes it could be newspaper articles. We also use the Georgia Registry website. And another odd helpful site was actually TripAdvisor that would list when organizations have been permanently closed. National organizations, be aware of organizations that were started in Georgia but have been relocated or national organizations whose main office are in Georgia. We still wanted to capture these records just in case. And then finally, expired domains. There are domains that have been expired and purchased by other organizations. Be especially careful at work because we found that some of these domains were purchased by organizations designed for explicit adult content. So be very well aware of that when looking at domains. But another consideration are consideration data models for municipalities and counties. So this was a little bit tricky. Another issue we discover is the challenge of trying to map real world messiness to the much cleaner data model of Wikidata. The challenge was not only trying to map it, but trying to reach consensus within the Wikidata community on how it should be handled. So municipalities include things like towns, villages, and cities. The P131 field is the field for administrative territorial entities in Wikidata. This P131 field is broad and can cover municipalities, counties, and states. In the Wikidata documentation for P131, it recommends that you list the, only list the single most local administrative territorial entity. Since the field is supposed to be both transitive and hierarchical and cascade upwards like you see on the left. But in Georgia, the borders of municipalities and counties were drawn independently and about 10% of municipalities in Georgia exist in more than one county. So there aren't transitive. This means that for our project, we can't rely on Wikidata's cascading hierarchy to be correct when it comes to searching for organizations by county. We reached out to the Wikidata community to try to find a solution to this challenge. But after several proposals and over a month of discussion on four separate Wikidata pages, no consensus was reached. So for our project, we explicitly declared municipality, county, and state all in the P131, P131 field with the hopes that consensus on a solution can be reached in the future. In the meantime, our queries are functioning well, and we figure it's better to have too much well-sourced information rather than too little. And another consideration are triggers and biases for employees working with the data set. Georgia is the 13th colony and steeped deeply in diverse American history. Some of, it, some of this history may be uncomfortable and triggering for people working with these data sets. Many of the records we will face will make us face our own biases. So no matter how we may personally feel about Georgia's diverse history, it must all be recorded fairly and equally. No record should be erased because we are uncomfortable. Our discomfort should push us into discourse about what each organization means to the state of Georgia now, and also looking at discourse and censorship, censorship and preservation. But on, on a lighter side, additional fun uses for the data set is Georgia tourism and unique queries. I'm somebody who loves doing historical tours. So if you are interested in learning more about Georgia's history, this project can also be used as a resource for tourism. A query can be run for places to visit on based on city, county, or region. 
So the image you see before are all the GLAM institutions located in DeKalb County, Georgia. Also, you can create unique queries, such as the Georgia Public Library Service has visitors per year from 2015 to 2017. It gives the annual visitors count for all GPLS systems were already in Wikidata. So we were able to get a little help from Wikidata community to graph those counts in another query. And here they are display in, displayed as a line graph. Granted, it's not the best line graph in the world, but you can type in that URL here at the bottom and to see it, see it in action for yourself. To me, it's just neat that this information is out there and readily accessible with no barriers to update, enhance, and enrich the data. Any publicly available and verified facts can be added to Wikidata, so feel free to explore. But the biggest project, our project impact, is that now that we're getting close to the end of this one-year project, we can look back and see that we have accomplished a lot. We have over 1,900 records uh, for Georgia NCH organizations in Wikidata and a single location on web for emergency responders to identify organizations in affected areas. We've developed this project to be open and reusable, and we have a plan for sustainability so that the data and the website can continue to be useful. That's right. it for us. <laughs> <laughs> are there any questions? There are questions. Thank you so much for your great talk. Um, there are a number of questions, so I'll jump in um, without my commentary and, uh, and question. Uh, the first is, how much overlap did you find among all the sources of data? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't know if I could give a percentage, but it, it really depends on the data set. So in the case of the Georgia Historical Records Advisory Council, their data set was probably the most diverse. Allison, you could probably tell us, since Allison dealt I, I with agree. the actual data hands-on, it had the most like smattering, spattering of, uh, of organizations across different disciplines. But some of the other data sets were very like specific to museums, specific to libraries. They, yes, I agree, they overlapped. Oh, it depends on the source, but we found a lot of organizations did overlap. And one of the challenges that we had as a result of that, particularly with the name variations, is that we kept a running index of all the organizations and we kept having to go back and dedupe because uh, organizations would have different names and we would discover as we went through that, oh, these two things with similar names are actually the same organization. Great, thank you. There are two related questions that I will sort of read together. I think I missed in the process section where Visual Studio Code was used. I thought I heard VS Code mentioned as part of the stack. Sorry for the geeky question, but I'm hopelessly interested in tech tools, which Jesse is also interested in and has asked to follow uh, a complimentary question. Um, for the aspects of the work using Visual Studio, did you use this to write the web scraping scripts? Uh, we're using VS Code. Also, when, when you were web scraping, might you talk about the time and processes it took to customize your script for the specific structure of the sites you scraped? So if you sure. could do um, I can talk in general, then also the web scraping. Yeah, yeah, I can talk about the, um, the scripting side and I'll let Allison talk about the, um, the managing uh, the CSV files. Um, I used Beautiful Soup to do some of the initial web scraping. Um, I've only had to use it in a couple of cases because in a lot of cases, if you reach out to the folks who, who manage the site, they will just provide you with a spreadsheet, you know, because a lot of times they'll have their own spreadsheet on the back end. Um, so there have been a couple of cases where I've used uh, Beautiful Soup and Python to create a uh, Python script to scrape different websites. And then we, um, Allison uh, can probably speak to this more, but we also use CSV to, uh, to do all of our editing in Visual Studio Code. So when we use Visual Studio Code, yeah, we, turn it, we turned it into a CSV. Um, with this work, it's easier if you have two monitors so you can keep Visual Studio Code on one monitor and then do the research for the records on another monitor. But it was just cross-referencing, cross-checking, looking for duplicates, things like that. So it requires a lot of research, but if you love it, it's great. A lot of the 
design decisions were around trying to uh, make this as free as possible. And so using CSV, which is an open format, is a lot easier than using Excel spreadsheets, which require you to have a Microsoft Office license. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that you're openly releasing source code, or you're not openly releasing source code due to sensitivity issues with the Galileo interface. Is it feasible to isolate the sensitive aspects of the code in a single module or file and release the rest of the main code? Um, parenthetically, we've done that with some of our code where we use a separate unreleased file for credentials and other sensitive or local configuration data. That's a, that's a good idea. I'll bring that up at our next uh, tech stakeholders meeting to see if that's possible. Thank you for the suggestion. Great. So, uh, did you add those name variations to Wikidata aliases? Labels, labels, labels. <laughs> Some of the organizations that we came across, like we thought it was one particular name, and as we got deeper and deeper into it, we found how different folks were calling it, and some of them ended up with, you know, almost a dozen labels, just in English alone. And we tried to capture as best as we could when exactly the organization changed their name. So we had the information for, okay, it was this name until this date. We tried to add that in Wikidata as well. Great, thank you. Uh, were there any properties or classes you needed that weren't already in Wikidata and did you propose any new ones? Um, and there's a follow-up question. Is there, any, uh, is there another source of geographic entities like geo names that better represent Georgia's municipalities or uh, county organization? And if so, could that geocoding source be incorporated into your Wikidata items? I realize these are actually not as, uh, as linked as I thought they were as I was reading them, but um, uh, if you could answer both of those. So the first was, um, were there any properties or classes you needed that weren't already in Wikidata? N not new ones that we needed to request the invention of. Um, but you know, I think the one that we really uh, faced a challenge with was that P131 field, trying to find out like how do we manage this. And um, although we didn't, we weren't able to reach consensus, and we just sort of shoved in all the extra data just to be on the safe side. That's the only real instance where we um, where we had any issues with the fields themselves. And what was the what was the second question? The second question was, is there another source of geographic entities like geo names that better represent Georgia's municipalities and county organization? Not that I know of. <laughs> I, and, and like Allison said, it's really because the municipality lines, the borders of the municipalities and the borders of the counties were drawn independently that they just don't match in a one-to-one -one relationship, which breaks that transitive property that's built into the P131. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did I hear you mention that some sites that were previously in the Wayback Machine got removed? Which ones and why? That is unexpected. I can't remember exactly why, but um, I would go in and capture an org, and then I would go back to the link to double check or quality control and see that the dom domain has expired or the organization has dissolved in the midst of this project. So can't really say to why, but we are grateful that we were able to capture those links before the organization dissolved. Yeah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm pulling from my memory, but in a lot of cases, these were things like local historical societies, which are volunteer organizations that don't necessarily have a physical location. They may just have like a website and an email address. Um, and so as those websites expired and they didn't pay for their domain, domain or whatever, um, the website would go down and then all we would have is the record in the Internet Archive Wayback Machine. We didn't have anything get removed from the Internet Archive Wayback Machine from the work that we were doing. But in some cases, like the website was just gone when we went back to look at it a week later after ca capturing it. Thank you. And we have time for just about one more question, but possibly squeeze in the last two. How can a new organization get added? Uh, let us know uh, if you're if you're in Georgia, we can we can definitely add you. Um, that's a that's a good sustainability question. I'm gonna write that down. I didn't think about that. Um, 
But one thing that we do have is we do have an other data set which we're using to capture any organizations that haven't shown up elsewhere. And so, for example, in Atlanta, we have the Trap Music Museum, which only opened, I think, in the last year. And so um, that was one that wasn't going to be on any of the other lists, lists, but the moment that we heard about it, we were like, oh, yeah, we have to capture that one as well. And so we are trying to capture individual ones as they come into our awareness. But that is a good question for from a sustainability perspective is how to make sure that we're capturing new organizations as they pop up. So thank you for that. Great, and thank you to both of you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I will post, if you are willing to answer in the Slack space, I will post any remaining questions in there and tag the two of you. Thank you. Great, thank you and so much. Up, up next, we have Laura Mandel from Texas A&M University's Advanced Research Consortium. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I am just going to um, post um, my slides to the Slack channel <clears throat> because there's a lot of URLs in there if you'd like to see them. So I've just done that. Um, and um, this is from a different world. So I'm not the experts in linked open data that all of you are. This is from the perspective of faculty who are digital humanities um, people who are creating uh, open access high quality scholarly resources. So um, what is Big Diva? Oh, I wanted to say, sorry, I'm director of the um, uh, Center of Digital Humanities Research at Texas A&M University. And I'm also more important director of the Advanced Research Consortium, which is where this faculty curation takes place. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about Big Diva um, today. But what is Big Diva? Well, it's a search and discovery interface that allows for serendipity. And um, it is in the, in the process of becoming a linked open data viewer. And that's uh, what I'm really trying to talk about today. And I so much welcome any input um, from anybody. What feeds this, um, this big diva catalog or interface um, is the ARC catalog. So to explain what that is, I have to tell you what ARC is and what the ARC catalog is. So the Advanced Research Consortium, and you can see the URL here, and of course there, all the URLs are available on the slides, um, is it's a, it's a consortium of uh, groups of scholars who've created um, online finding aids for their particular disciplines. Uh, you can think of it really as a consortium for uh, digitizing uh, disciplinary bibliographies or indexes um, associated with specific disciplines, uh, like a print uh, bibliography or index for a particular scholarly set of fields. So the consortium is made up of nines.org, 18th Connect, Mesa Medieval, Modernist Networks, Studies in Radicalism Online, and um, the ARC office, which is at Texas A&M, the Advanced Research Consortium itself, provides um, a technological and uh, social, in a way, or institutional in, um, services for these scholarly communities. So we um, provide the technical infrastructure, which is a solar server, we provide the Colex hosting, which is their interfaces. We uh, provide instruction for metadata creation and ingestion, and we negotiate with proprietors. We also engage in sustainability efforts. So ARC, the technological infrastructure, is a solar server, and it is indexed through um, RDF records. And those that index the solar server uh, allows faceted searching on these web apps for these particular scholarly uh, communities. And you can see that they have a similar interface. This is nines.org. This is 18thconnect.org. This is Mesa Medieval. Uh, we have on staging networked early American resources, which um, has contains the whole American Antiquarian Society catalog. We have Studies in Radicalism, which is a collection at um, Michigan State University Libraries. When 
Nines was the first of these instances of communities of scholars who were curating um, digital data. It was first started in 2003 by Jerome McGann and Bethany Novisky, and they have um, an article in the Electronic Book Review about it if you'd like to read more. Uh, their goal uh, in, in 2005 was, which is very early, was to um, create an organization that would provide peer review so that scholar produced projects of high quality um, could be become part of a complete research environment, which means also proprietary resources. If you're talking about scholars who are doing disciplinary work, they need both and ideally intermixed. And that's what we did, as you can see here in our faceted search interface. Uh, so NINES has collected journals, it's peer reviewed digital projects. We have other collections, which I'll say more about in a moment, and then exhibits built on these sites by users. So if you were to search 18thconnect.org, if you were to go to the search tab, you would see these facets. And what you can see is that there are journals that are proprietary and there are journals that are open source. Um, so you can see, um, you know, um, we have Project Muse and JSTOR in here, articles from them, um, uh, and actually journal runs from them. We have peer reviewed projects, which all of us, uh, the communities themselves peer review using disciplinary experts as well as technological experts. And then we include, um, sorry, um, proprietary, we include proprietary uh, databases such as um, all of 18th century collections online, early English books online, and in fact, the whole English short title catalog, which you'll see in a moment. So from any one of these online finding aid sites and scholarly communities, you can search all of them. And there are helpful facets. You can facet by full text only or free culture only. Um, the um, metadata is, is really for finding. It is not library quality metadata. It's a finding aid metadata. But just because it is designed according to scholarly principles of how to think about finding things, it doesn't mean it isn't rigorous. Uh, it's in RDF. Right now they are flat XML RDF files, but we are in the process of going to a full linked open data store for the whole ARC catalog. Because of our metadata, it's very lightweight. All of it is, um, has been assigned by their creators, which are individual projects, uh, a Creative Commons zero license. So these metadata categories organize by format, which is basically just the DC type. Um, it's a selection from DC type. Um, and discipline, that's not anywhere at the moment. Discipline is the discipline to which um, these items would be interesting. And that's determined by scholars um, as they submit their metadata for their projects. Then also uh, we have uh, searching by genre. And that too is custom made by ARC, a genre list. I will say it has evolved um, beautifully um, because we have evolved by taking in more and more projects so eventually, when we make the art catalog into a linked open data store, we hope to be able to get it into um, the linked open data cloud. And there's a precedent for that, for scholarly um, stores being um, taken in by the linked open data, data cloud. Um, some of you may know that more about that than I do, but the example that I have is um, Pleiades, which is um, an historical atlas of the classical world. And uh, it is now in uh, lodcloud.net. Uh, so the ARC structure is basically this. We have this solar server and it feeds currently metadata to all of the uh, scholarly communities. And I just showed you their online finding aids. Um, and we have some forthcoming scholarly communities, uh, digital disability studies, 
um, as well as uh, um, the um, American uh, Antiquarian Society. And we will be hosting, we hope, the English Short Title Catalog 21, uh, which is made of linked open data. And that work has been done. Uh, so it's a matter of um, ingesting it into the new ARC linked open data store. So the way you can see all of the data in the ARC catalog at once, aside from going to one node and selecting all the facets for all of the um, community um, organizations, is you can go to bigdiva.org. And Big Diva is a search interface visualization tool. It's organized by um, resource as a default. So when you get to the Big Diva page, the first thing you're going to see are the contributors of metadata to the ARC catalog. And I'll say more about what I mean by that in a moment. The second thing you'll, you can select an, another view, which is the genre view. And the genre view um, has all of those ARC genre categories in it that I mentioned. And then there's a discipline view and a format view. And there is also a time slider. So if you were looking for a medieval genre, for instance, you might slide the time slider down to 1485. So when you get to Big Diva, there is a dialog box that explains to you how it works. And I recommend to people reading it, though we um, are having trouble in user studies at moments. Uh, some people tend to skip through it too quickly. Um, but basically what happens is when you first get there, you, you can, here I am in other digital collections. So these are proprietary and open source. You can see the English short title catalog in there, the British Museum. And I've selected the Walters Museum in Baltimore. When I select it, a menu pops up and I can see in the Walters Museum collection, digital collection, I can um, search by genre, discipline, format, and individual results. The minute I've selected this node, individual results start popping up. But let me show you what happens if I select genre. So I'm, I'm going here to this menu and selecting genre. And so here you can see um, the genres that are available of items in the Walters catalog. And if I select nonfiction, um, oh, this is, these are the genres. And you can see they correspond to the genres in the interfaces of the communities. Uh, if I select uh, nonfiction, I can then look using the menu um, for discipline to which these items are interesting. If I select manuscript studies here, I can select the format. And here's the node menu coming up again. And um, here's, here are the formats that I, are, again, are in, um, you, you can see this taxonomy in all of our community sites. And so um, I've, I will select then um, illustration and then uh, on the node menu, ask for individual results. When I get the node menu with the individual result, there's a little link and it, when I click on it, it takes me out to that individual result. So this is a, manuscript image from the Walters Museum in Baltimore. You can trace your path. Uh, we are building uh, the possibility for exporting search uh, results. It works really well on both a laptop or a big screen. And I've done um, many big screen presentations of Big Diva uh, at the University of Rochester. This is Texas A&M, uh, University of Rochester. Um, and um, North Carolina State University. There are some demos of Big Diva, uh, one for a, a demo on the big screen, and you're welcome to watch these. Um, they're available on YouTube. The code for Big Diva is open access and available on GitHub. And as will be the forthcoming linked open data version of Big Diva, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, and I will explain why it will be um, available both on our GitHub account and through linksproject.canada. So the linksproject.canada is um, a project that was just funded for $5 million by the Canadian government 
to build um, a, an infrastructure for um, cultural research. So a linked open data store for cultural resource research. And it is being hosted in by Compute Canada, but the data in it is not simply Canadian. Uh, related to Canadian culture. It's for Canadian cultural researchers, so it's data from all over the world. Here is Big Diva, and we're re trying to re-envision it as a linked open data um, interface. And so you might see uh, a different kind of node menu that is specifying uh, in accordance with Sparkle queries. Um, and here you might see people and select Maria, Mariah Abdi and, and find that she has um, a birth and lived connection to um, Middle Essex and that she's author of the, po you know, among all of her works, The Poetess. You'd still have the timeline. But what we're going to try to do with this linked open data browser is we are going to try to make it three-dimensional for um, to turn it into a rich prospect browser, which will allow seeing things at many different levels of granularity. We are experimenting right now with a JavaScript library called Tapspace, um, but we don't know that that will be what we use. So here is um, oh, just a wireframe idea of what Big Diva might look like in 3D space. So we've got people, Mariah Abdi, places and works, and here's a wire, the wireframe. So if we have here Mariah Abdi and works, you might be able to see in the works um, a offshoot of resources and titles. And then you could zoom in to one of these offshoots. So I'm going to zoom into titles. And here you can see um, the titles are here of her poems. And then if I zoom in even further to the, to the title with the poem, The Poetess, um, I can find it on the a link to it. It's available in the Poetess archive. And I can also, if I zoom in even further, get a live H, uh, HTML, you know, a live browser window where I can scroll around in this document and follow its links to images and such things. So um, the participation of Coder and ARC in the Linked Infrastructure for Network Cultural Scholarship Links project um, is described fully on the Coder website. Uh, and you can also, of course, go to linksproject.ca to read more about it. What will be involved is um, we will be taking our scholarly um, you know, enhanced sort of um, metadata. Um, and it's really just been enhanced by um, scholarly, scholarly information about genre and about discipline of interest, uh, as well as format. Um, and that taxonomy is going to become an ontology or part of the links ontology. So I encourage you to go to bigdiva.org um, and to also go to ARC, which is ar-c.org, where you can read more about Big Diva, both supporting it and seeing what users have had to say about it. So I'm conscious that I was um, so worried about going over with my 67 slides <laughs> that I may have gone too quickly. Um, but um, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and um, be ready for questions. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so the first question that is in the Q&A, did you tell us that for your genre listings, if you are sourcing that from a vocabulary that will be using URIs in the LOD implementation, if so, which ones? So um, that is a really excellent question and an expert question. Uh, it is not for me to decide. Oh, I guess I could turn on my video. <laughs> it is not for me to decide. Um, it is the, the there is a, there are a whole team of people working on that with the Links project in, in Canada. 
So um, obviously some of the, um, the existing vocabularies have to be taken into account. Um, so Getty vocabularies uh, for cultural materials, for instance, but um, how that is going to be expanded and moreover, how crosswalks are going to be made for ontologies for specific projects that all participate in links, that has to be decided as well. I hope that answers your question. Great, um, indeed, uh, he wrote into the, uh, into the chat. Uh, by the way, if I suddenly vanish, um, there's a torrential thunderstorm going on, or at least what looks like torrential rain uh, at the moment. So I apologize in advance and Michelle will jump in if that happens. Um, um, great. Uh, so I am quite interested in how this will be tested and shared to scholars across disciplines. This is a huge and amazing project. Um, so if you could talk about that. Yeah, so the, it's so difficult to get the word out both to libraries to help support us and to scholars. Uh, what we do for scholars is we give presentations and workshops at all the, the conferences. So NINES uh, goes to Nasser and NAVSA and 18th Connect to ASEX. And we give demonstrations of these online finding aids to faculty all the time. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is if you search Big Diva uh, and um, you just look at um, other collections in the resources homepage and you slide the time slider down to 1485, you'll see all the medieval resources in the art catalog. And one of the major ones is Diam. If a student searches Google and just types in digital medieval manuscripts, they don't get to Diam until page five of the Google results. So we really want faculty and students to use this. How do we get the word out? Well, um, my, the dean of my library is David Carlson, a very gracious person, uh, took me to EBSCO <laughs> so that we could talk with EBSCO about how to do this. And he had his marketing team call me and his marketing team called and they said, okay, this is what you need to do. And I'm a scholar. I cannot spend my life marketing. I can't go to all the library conferences and do all that. I actually have to publish research and run a digital humanities center. The promise of linked open data, however, I think will really help us. When I was um, trying to talk to a, a, um, the, the National Libraries of Qatar about supporting the Big Diva project, they wanted to know, could there be a link in, you know, when items are retrieved from their catalog uh, via online searching of the library catalog, could there be links to Big Diva and the only kind of links you could think about, I hope I'm making sense here, would be a sort of Amazon more like this, only of course it couldn't depend upon availability um, or you know, um, uh, top sellers as Amazon's commercialized, it's more like this. But um, how would we do that in Big Diva? We would like to have a link that says, look for more items like this in a visual interface in Big Diva. Well, we can do it with linked open data that's what we really believe is that um, we could make um, it possible to um, find more like this if the, if the parameters, uh, maybe a level up, are passed to the linked open data um, browser. Um, and so, you know, if I've searched, if I'm from sort of asking for more like this from Mariah Abdi's um, poem, The Poetess, or a book of her poems, what I might get is a, um, a return to, um, to the Big Diva interface, which includes um, sort of all of the publications in literary annuals, all of the poetry of the 19th century, but visualized so people can decide then which direction they want to go. And I should say that one of the, um, the major um, participants in the Lynx grant in Canada, and also um, uh, somebody who's working on creating this um, linked open data browser platform, Kimberly Martin, has studied um, the possibilities for serendipity in Big Diva, and they are high. They're a little bit like walking around the stacks and, and finding something you didn't expect. <laughs> Great, thank you. There's a few um, there's a few comments that uh, have come in, um, both in the, a question and a comment that align with that. So I'm going to jump around the order a bit. Um, in the chat, uh, there's a comment: visualization of linked data is a fairly challenging area. 
So it is really interesting to see the combination of the more traditional node link view with a temporal component time slider. So I just wanted to share that that was being shared in the chat. Thank you, yes. Right now, Big Diva is in D3JS. Um, and so, you know, it, it needs to be basically um, built again from scratch uh, as a risk, rich prospect browser that uses, link op uses linked open data. And also about um, sort of analogous to the question or the comments on uh, visualization, the huge screens are great. Um, are there ways to incorporate the advantages of the big, big view into smaller screens? Yes. And um, so if you take a look at the demo on the small screen, you will see that Big Diva is really very usable in that uh, just on a PC screen or a laptop screen. Um, the 3D zooming feature is um, what we hope to make it possible for zooming in um, to go deep dive deeper into your data. But we plan to include in the frame navigational information so that you know where you've zoomed and, and how to get back from where you've zoomed in. I hope that answers your question. Uh, perhaps they'll uh, address that in chat, but I'm, I'm, it sounds to me like you did indeed. Uh, in the same set of metadata, there are broader terms uh, such as physical object and more specific terms such as codex. Is there some overlap with how these terms are applied? There is some overlap um, because, of course, manuscripts can be codices. <laughs> um, but um, the uh, there is overlap. So you you when you are searching through Big Diva, you may get to the same point from multiple directions. And it seemed I was muted, sorry. I believe you started addressing the next question a little while ago when you were talking about crosswalking in the links uh, environment, but given the wide variety of data sources, how complicated has it been to do aggregation? So um, aggregation is um, well, the way, so I'll, I'll talk about aggregation before linked open data first. Um, Bethany Novisky really developed the aggregating model um, for nines and subsequently for all the ARC communities. She was really prescient because she did it in the, you know, the early 2000s uh, and realized that RDF um, formatted metadata would be the way to go. When, when the group first started meeting, though, in 2003, and it took us until 2005, you know, we had all kinds of questions about how to aggregate. Would nines actually publish all these scholarly resources like the Walt Whitman archive or um, the Dante Rossetti archive or romantic circles, which are all uh, scholarly quality publications of digital work, uh, digital resources? Um, how would we get them all to talk to each other in a, a finding aid like nines? Would we ingest them all? Would we get a publisher to ingest them all? We, would we get a library to ingest them all and feed it from there? What we ultimately went with is just linking out. So just as the link went out to the Walters Museum, all the links go out to all the digital resources. And when a digital resource applies for peer review, they have to confirm that their URL will stay the same or notify us of when it changes. And they have to submit their sustainability plan to us. So theoretically, there should be no dead links. We have to work on it all the time, but theoretically. Um, so it's an integrator because it's very lightweight. It's a, it's, a, it's a very lightweight metadata form, which you can read all about on that wiki address I sent. And um, you know, it's uh, very easy for projects to participate. Um, and then we don't take anything in, we just send people out. So that's why proprietors have been willing to contribute metadata because it's, it's advertising. If you click on a JSTOR item and your library doesn't subscribe and you're not, or you're not on proxy server, um, you will be told that you have to buy the article. You'll hit a paywall, in other words. So um, it really is able to mix proprietary, um, integrate, uh, sorry, aggregate proprietary and open source, open uh, source data very well. 
We don't anticipate that changing with linked open data as you would dig down further into the you know, trying to get down to actual texts or actual resources, you would still just be thrown out to various URLs. And the 3D browser, the Zoomable 3D browser, will allow that to happen. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we are actually pretty much out of time. So I would like to thank you for your talk um, and also to thank all of the speakers today for, for, your, for your talks. Um, this was a fascinating 90 minutes. And um, uh, as I'm speaking, uh, there another question came in, which unfortunately we are out of time. But Laura, if you don't mind, I will post that into the, um, into the Slack space and hopefully you can engage there. So um, with that, I would like to thank everybody who has participated in today's session um, for participating in the last session of the discovery track of the 2020 LD4 conference. Um, so thank you all. Um, round of applause. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.